Hey everyone, welcome back. In the previous episode, we created the voting poll through the voting poll tests, and then we created the voting poll factory through voting poll factory tests, which, which is essentially responsible for creating the voting poll. And then we implemented a voting poll interactor that is responsible for, again, calling the creation of the voting poll and actually persisting it to some kind of persistence mechanism, which is going to be hidden behind the iVoting system persistence interface. Now, since we started leaning towards implementing persistence, one of persistence techniques are databases, saving stuff to the database. And this is what we're going to do today. We're going to take a look at how we can interact with databases, and primarily we're going to take a look at Entity Framework. So for this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close both of these tests. I'm going to back away the test explorer for now because we're not going to be writing any tests. Same as we did in our sandbox project, we're going to create another project for Entity Framework where we're just going to play around with it. And this is just to get you in the habit of creating projects. It's not scary to create a project, you know, just create a project just to play with it, throw it away. Let's go ahead, create new one, sandbox.efcore, big F, uh, efcore, let's create that. Uh, now that we're here, I'm not sure what this uh, breakpoint was about. Uh, one thing to run the sandbox efcore, let's go ahead and append efcore here to make sure that we're going to be indeed running this project because we now have a couple of projects here at the top if you look where I'm selecting. Uh, want to switch to sandbox EF core and press the run button and make sure that the console window outputs uh, the hello world with EF core. Right, so now that we're sure that we're running the correct project, let's go ahead, delete this and get entity framework into our project and talk a little bit about what it is. Okay, so let's go ahead, manage nugget packages. We will browse for entity framework. And you're going to see a couple of packages here and the entity framework right here. Uh, this is for the .NET version, not for .NET Core. This is the entity framework 6, right? What we want is entity framework core. So Microsoft.entityFramework core. Go ahead and install the latest package. Uh, this uh, day and age it is 3.1.1. Uh, let's go ahead and install that. So let's close that. Let's close this. So let's talk a little bit about Entity Framework. What is actually Entity Framework? It's an Object Relational Mapper. Otherwise, the acronym for it is an ORM. And its primary task is uh, to be able to map C-sharp objects to a relational database. So there are many relational databases out there. Entity Framework is meant to take away the need to write SQL, and you end up writing only C-sharp, and it translates your C-sharp code into SQL. So instead of using SQL to interface with the database, you're now going to be using Entity Framework to interface with the database. And on addition, on top of that, you're gonna get model binding. What I mean by model binding is, usually in the old days, if you haven't ever written a query to the database, you would write something like select all from, uh, I don't know, let's say products so we have a bunch of products this is some some uh, this is a query that we would run against the database and what it would return is some kind of an either an unstructured object so we'd have a object response which we would then have to do something like let's just call this a new object and this would be the query where we get a new object and then we would need to actually do something like grab a fruit uh, fruit and equals we would have to cast this response or you would have something called data tables and if you ever encounter encounter data tables you don't want to encounter them anymore and then see framework sounds really good right so Instead of writing all this and converting objects and, st and, all, and, and all that stuff, Entity Framework takes care of all that for you, right? So you're no longer writing queries. You're no longer getting unstructured objects. You're getting statically typed objects from the database without writing SQL. And this is all that Entity Framework is about, as well as being able to connect to different database providers like MSSQL, so the Microsoft uh, SQL server, or Postgres and other providers.
let's go ahead and get started. What are the basics of Entity Framework? Well, if you remember the package that we installed, again, we can check it by going to the CS branch here, Microsoft Entity Framework. We can just grab the namespace. We can pop it here and we can take a look, right? So there's a bunch of stuff here, but the primary thing that we're interested in is this DB context class, okay? This is what we want to create an instance of, and this is the primary abstraction. This is your wrapper for the database. So if you think of a database as a present that contains all your data, you go ahead and wrap it with the DB context, and then you use C Sharp to open that present up, right, with all your precious data. So let's go ahead and create a class. And usually what I do is I will create a public class app DB context. When you're creating your app DB context, you want it to inherit from this uh, DB context class. Okay, so we're going to put it up here and we're going to take this namespace and we're going to make a using statement here. So just so we can use this class like this. All right. So we have the app DB context. What does this actually give us? Well, as I said, this is a wrapper around your database. What you do with your own AppDB context is you provide abstractions on a table. So what a table is, is a collection, right? You have rows, you're going to have multiple rows of columns. So every single row is a data type. And data types that we have, well, uh, not really any data type. You can't have a single data type as a row. You need to have a complex object. And a complex object... We will go with fruit for now. So I'm going to create a fruit and this would equal to one row, right? So one row will represent, will contain all the data about a fruit. And I'm going to go ahead and say prop string name. So I can name this fruit orange or apple. So I know what it is, right? And then I might have properties like weight in kilograms, grams, whatever, uh, depending on how my application uh, operates. This doesn't matter right now because right now we're just essentially modeling the database. This is how one row would look like, and this is how one row would map to this object. Now, because a table is a collection, so essentially an IE numerable, that's, your, that's gonna be your IE numerable of fruit, or your uh, fruit array, or your list of fruit, a table in a database is a collection of rows. And if this is one row, then the table is a collection of rows, right? So what we're going to be registering in our AppDB context is a type called DB set. Okay. And this DB set is essentially a collection. And we are going to find out why in a second. And we're going to say that it's a type of fruit, right? So a collection with rows of fruit, right? And then every property of the complex object is going to equal to one column okay so let's go ahead and call this public and we will create it just like any other property here and the name of this property will actually equal to the name of the table so you want to make it plural like fruits okay because don't forget db set is a collection and we're going to take a look at why now so if we click on db set and we press f12 we're going to go to its implementation and if you will you will see if you look here uh, you will see the interfaces that it implements so an i enumerable is a collection so this class actually implements a collection type so this is a collection i enumerable are collections in c sharp okay but another important thing is this i queryable interface which is how Entity Framework builds up queries uh, into that translate into SQL. But that's a little bit too much detail that we don't really want to, don't really need to know to actually be able to use Entity Framework, right? Just make sure you know DBSet is a collection from which you can construct queries, okay? So we're not going to go into too complicated examples. We're just going to go ahead and try to query the app DB context at this point. So let's go ahead and instantiate this context and this will crash and we will just see the error just so we understand the components of this. So we have the context and let's go ahead and grab a fruit from it, right? So we're going to go to the context instance and just like any other object, 
we're just gonna navigate to this property so we're gonna go to fruits okay we're here and just like you would have a collection with stuff in it you want to use link to query it so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna ask for first or default and async i don't want asynchronous for now uh let's uh, import link and this is just going to grab the first or default fruit from the database obviously we're not going to have anything there so what i want to do here is just console uh read line yeah read line just so i can put a breakpoint here so we can inspect what happens okay so we make a db context with a table of type fruits so every single row is going to represent a fruit and each property is a column we grab our context and now we're going to grab a fruit from the database right let's go ahead and run this okay and the first thing uh, we are going to get an exception just as i said so the error is no database provider has been configured for this db context so this is the the, the first sentence is kind of gives away all of the error so to understand the error no database provider so we need a database provider and as i said in the beginning there are multiple database providers so entity framework as a library is abstract enough to be able to fit many database providers like mssql postgres etc right so let's go ahead and get ourselves a database provider and because i don't actually want to connect to an actual database because we're testing here uh, we will do the actual database connection when we build up to the application part right so let's go ahead into the nugget packages here. And what we're gonna look for is, again, let's just type in entity framework and we're gonna look for what providers we can find here, right? So uh, dot relational doesn't look like a provider. Abstractions doesn't look like, doesn't sound like a provider. This SQL server, right? So Microsoft SQL server database provider. So it will say in the description which provider it is. And if you Google around, I'm pretty sure you will be able to find other providers for entity framework. Primarily, what I'm looking for is the in-memory provider. So there's going to be no database. All the data is going to be stored in memory. But the beaut beautiful thing is with NC Framework is if it was if it works with the in-memory database, it's going to work with uh, any other provider, right? So you can switch between any of them, and it will just work, right? So let's go ahead and grab our in-memory provider. And the, the in-memory provider is not really a relational database. It's just the relational database is meant to be a model of objects and their addresses and pointers. This is literally the memory, okay? So we have our provider. If we run the application, nothing is going to happen, right? Because all we did now is we just downloaded the package. We actually didn't do anything. So what we need to do is override a method where we are going to set up a configuration for this. So what the easiest way to do this is if somewhere in here, uh, in the space of the AppDB context, you're gonna press Alt Enter, and we're going to generate overrides. Now, all of the overrides are selected. We just wanna deselect all, and we just wanna grab the on configuring override, right? So, Let's just override this and I'm just going to show you where it comes from. So if we go to DB context, somewhere here, we are going to see the on configuring that it's virtual. There is probably a base implementation for it because this is a, no, actually virtual. All right. Basically it's here and it might be implementing it. And on here, when we call base, whatever other on configuration has been done there, that's where we want to run it. So if you want the unconfiguring of your DB context that you're inheriting from to be kind of prioritized, you want to configure here and then the configurations that will run after, if they kind of override what you type here, then they will override. If you want to run the base configurations, but then override the base configuration in some sense, uh, you will. What you want to write your configuration here. In our case, there is no actual configuration because we're inheriting from the base wrapper right so there might be there are, there are going to be times where you're going to be implementing the identity database where you have the logging system and stuff like that and that no the knowledge will come in handy there or you might have parent db contexts and you're going to be inheriting from those so just being aware that when you call when you call the base is important so 
on configuring why do we actually need it this is where we tell the AppDB context which options to use it can also be set in the constructor and we're going to explore that version when we go to the ASP.NET core part so let's go to options builder let's grab our use in memory database function and uh, this function you're gonna have it because you have just added the package and uh, the one thing that it needs is just a name for your database i'm gonna go be ahead and be an original and i'm just gonna name a database okay so i'm just gonna remove the space up top here we configured to use the in, -in memory database let's go ahead and run the application so we get another error, and this is because our fruit requires a primary key to be defined, all right? Uh, so uh, the reason I didn't put a primary key here from the start is during this series, if you're just joining in to watch about Entity Framework, uh, during this series, we're using test-driven development, where essentially it might not be when we are extracting the voting poll, uh, it might not be that we actually thought about having an id as part of our models right so it's not always that we will want to actually define a property id uh, because we might want to then come up with a test to make this property to make this test pass kind of thing but for now let's go ahead and uh, satisfy this error right so we're going to add the id and then we're going to take a look at how we might want to write this without actually having to add the ID property, right? Which is a concept of shadow properties. And I think not a lot of tutorials teach it. So the fruit is null. The reason we get null is because we set here to default. And again, if you know link, you know this. Uh, if you, you either get the first element or you will get the default and default is null. All right, so this is working and we can prove that this is working by adding a fruit. So by adding, again, we use uh, the app db context. We're gonna go to fruits. We're going to go ahead to add and add a new fruit. And we're just going to add an orange, right? Best fruit. Uncontested. Uh, and let's say orange. Okay, and let's actually uh, pop this in a variable because we want to actually observe it. So orange. And we're going to set it here, right? So uh, let's actually put the breakpoint here. And we're going to observe what happens to it. So let's run. Okay, we hit the breakpoint. So at this point, the orange is created. We're going to take a look at it. ID is zero, uh, name is orange, and weight is uh, zero. We're going to step once. We're going to inspect the orange, and we're going to see that the ID is null. So Entity Framework recognizes the ID property as the primary key for the database, and it will assign it automatically. Okay, now... Uh, this is important because sometimes you will want to generate properties and assign IDs to other properties, but I, I'll, I'll show you how this can be used later on. Uh, but now, after we have added the orange, let's go ahead and get the fruit, and the fruit is still null, right? So what it gives, we actually added the fruit to the collection, but there is no fruit in the collection. Like, hold up, what's going on, right? So uh, with database, with databases with um i think most databases i'm not i'm not aware of databases that don't have transactions okay the concept of transaction is imagine that you're in a shop right and you have a shopping list let's say you have uh, like 10 20 items on your shopping list a the concept of transaction is essentially you go get all your items you put them in the basket and then you make one transaction for all those items okay you purchase like 10 or 15 items in one transaction imagine now be having to buy an item every time you want to buy an item you have to go get that item go to the register buy it then go get your next item and go buy it right so you would have to make the trip to the register like 10 or 20 times okay and this is how this uh, example essentially works every time you add it you build up your transaction this is essentially as putting your fruits in the basket okay and then you want to go to the checkout and uh, purchase your items right so let's go ahead and delete this uh, line uh, i'm going to put the breakpoint back here and the way that you actually commit the transaction so committing transaction is actually saving stuff to the base to database to writing okay you're writing you're purchasing you're kind of putting a stamp you're sealing the deal 
uh, you're gonna call save changes and usually you call save changes async but as an example it doesn't matter right now okay so we get a fruit we add it to the basket and then we check out we buy it we save it to the database all is good and then we should be able to retrieve it let's run it and let's see this happen okay so again orange will generate an id once it's added and then we'll save changes and now the fruit we can actually retrieve it and it's the same orange with id one okay so let's move on to the next bit as i mentioned before sometimes you're gonna be in a case where you don't want the id on your fruit right it's going to be a database concept that has nothing to do with your application. This is something that Entity Framework needs to track your object, whatever. Let's run the application. Let's see it break. And you're like, let's add this. And you're like, damn it. Why there is no key? Okay. So the, the, the next concept is shadow properties. Okay. So shadow properties are properties that Entity Framework is going to create for you in the database but not on your you don't actually need those on your actual model okay so the way you would do this is to create a property in the database that doesn't actually exist on your model you need to generate an override and we'll just select all and we will grab the on model creating and let's create this again we don't have any models in our db context in our base one so i'm going to remove that and I'm gonna grab the model builder and in here, uh, I will grab an entity. And here, all I have to specify is the fruit. Okay, so I'm essentially selecting this type. So for this type, we then want to call a function. This is just how you do it, right? You have to select the entity, the type for which you want to configure that type. How, how, does, that, how does the wrapper interact with this type? Okay, this is how you configure it. So this is essentially just a selection for this entity. Let's go ahead and now configure it. So we're gonna grab a property, right? And here we're gonna define a property ID. And this is all we need to do. A special case with ID to be a primary key is that it's by con convention here. We're just adding a ID property. And now entity framework will be able to realize that this is an ID property and it will keep track of it in the background. But the fruit, this class fruit will never be aware of it okay so let's go ahead and run this and let's make sure that our program doesn't crash when we add it to the basket okay so this is actually my error so all it says here is that the property id cannot be added to the type fruit because there was no property type specified so the keywords are property type no property type specified right so it doesn't know what type the id is right so let's stop this and what we have to do, same as we have specified the type here, same as we specify the type anywhere, uh, we have to open our angle brackets and we have to say that it's an integer, okay? And by the way, if you're ever confused between what type of key you wanna be using for your ID, remember that an integer is preferred because it is easier to process for a computer. The only time you need to use a GUID or a string for your ID is if you need global redundancy. If you're going to be planning for migrating databases and uh, usually the only time you need them is for user records okay so uh, we added the type we can add this here and we can still grab the fruit with name orange okay so uh that's very nice that we can do that uh, now the problem will, will arise that fruit is part of your core logic right it's going to be somewhere in the business rules the business rules doesn't know anything about the database and it doesn't know anything about the ui uh, how do you extract the id because you need to somehow purchase that fruit somehow to identify that fruit for the system you can't do it by name okay you need an identifier so let's go ahead and simulate something like a view model something that you're going to display in the ui you still want to see the name you still want to see the weight but you also want the id okay so let's go ahead and put an id here and we're just gonna add a vm on the end of the fruit so we know that it's something that we're gonna send to the browser to be displayed as a model right we're gonna use it for the template uh one thing is at the moment we've been just selecting this uh, same type we can also use link to select other types and uh, 
And really, they translate very well into native SQL, which is how Entity Framework still uses to access the database. So what we're going to be doing is for every fruit that we have in the DB set collection, we're going to convert to fruit VM. Okay, so let's go ahead and call select. And here, X, uh, whatever I type X is, is just such a short uh, uh, term for this small scope because X only exists here. But uh, essentially, X is a type of fruit. If you want, if it's more readable for you, you can type fruit here. Uh, I'm going to stick with X. Uh, so here, and in, actually, instead of X, what I want to do is select a new fruit VM. So I'm going to be selecting this new object. And let me drop this down to new line so it's a little bit easier to see. And this as well. Okay, so here I will uh, not the orange. I'll just grab the name and I will assign it from the original fruit's name. So X is the original fruit and fruit VM is the new model that we're going to end up with. So this fruit is going to be of type fruit VM. Okay, so it, it should have the ID property. Now, the way we add the ID property is we need to use an EF uh, static functions class. And here is where we can access a property function, where again, we have to specify the type. Uh, we have to pass the object from which we want to get the shadow property. And we're going to say ID here. We're going to put a comma on the end for the syntax to compile. Okay. So we're going to extract the shadow property ID from this object. And this is just the syntax to do that sort of thing. So uh, I'm just going to put a breakpoint here so we can take a look at the fruit and make sure that we are actually getting the ID in our fruit VM. Okay. So let's run this. Okay. So here we are. Let's take a look at the fruit. And here we can see that the ID is one. And uh, we can kick it up a notch. Let's go ahead and add an apple. So apple, orange, and this is an apple. Let's add another item to our basket. I'll separate this a little bit. And now instead of first or default, I'll change this to list to select all of these. And uh, just to understand, j just to sort of make you understand at which point something becomes a list and so this is where the ex where the query executes. I guess I haven't actually explained that yet, but let's go ahead and see this happen. So, yeah, we this is now fruits. This is not just a fruit. So if we take a look at fruit, uh, we will see that orange has ID one and that apple has ID two. So Entity Framework will automatically increment your IDs, right? So it automatically generates these. Okay. So let's now quickly dissect at which point the query right here is a query and at which point it is, is it actually an object, right? At which point does Entity Framework actually call the database, right? Well, usually it's by the ending of it being either a to list or a first where you're really specifying what you actually need. Right, and you can also do this by the return type. So, if the return type is an I queryable, also when you do a where clause, so you're trying to filter the collection, you would say wait is more than one. If you hover over where, that also returns an I queryable. So, sometimes what you can do is let's say we'll change this to query, we'll return this to list, and let's run this and we'll just see what happens. So we have no fruits with weight over one. So if we take a look at the query, what you will see is the result expanding the result view will enumerate the result. So at the moment, query doesn't have any items. So it's an empty collection. It's a collection that is yet to be evaluated. So this is kind of this lazy behavior in C sharp. So all that means is that this is meant to be something and we haven't yet, comp the computer hasn't yet worked out what it is. It's kind of like this future concept. Uh, so it has yielded no results, again, because uh, wh when we have actually done this, this is when it has called the database, okay? So let's go ahead and try this again, but we will do, uh, we will d remove this. Uh, and again, we'll take a look at the query. Again, we'll have the results view. And now if we drop down, 
at the at the moment where we drop down here and if you're working with a real database you will actually see the delay of uh, the communication being with the data the communication with the database happening because here it's happening with memory okay so select is not really a select it's kind of a map function so but just remember anything that returns an i queryable an i enumerable isn't uh, the database the database hasn't been called yet when you end up with actual objects by calling something like first single to list and these are the functions that are actually querying or executing the query on the deba database and that's when input and output happens io that's when you need asynchrony okay so let's call to list here and this is no longer a query uh, and by the way just again just to build on the point sometimes you will do things like so you will have some kind of a condition and this is a, a condition this is a point where you might want to break away from the query right so you will have some kind of condition and this kind of thing will not actually execute on the database you can add some sort of a filter and override the query if you meet this can meet this condition and this is where we can say wait is more than one right so if we made some condition let's add this parameter to the query and then we can go ahead and execute this query right so these sort of things are possible uh, let's go back to our more simpler example and we'll rename this back to fruits now one important point is it would be important sometimes to see the value of when you uh, see the value of the id when you actually add it to the database okay so how do we actually see the id well it's something similar to this property but we have to use the context because you have to remember that this context is what's keeping track of the transactions that are happening right so when uh, you call save changes that's when the transaction happens okay and usually the appdb context connections are short-lived but we are not concerned about that for now what we want to do is be able to grab an id value without actually querying the database as we've seen before it is assigned somewhere around here so uh, during this add statement so what we want to do is be able to grab the orange id from the orange so what we would do is we would call it into our context we would call the entry function and in the entry function we would pass the object for which changes are occurring and here we can grab the property and whoop, let's say id and we will get the current value and at the moment this will be a type of object so we can specify that it's an integer and now we should be able to get an integer so i'm just going to put a breakpoint here and make sure that this equals to one before we proceed okay and this equals to one okay nice now uh we are going to add a little bit of spice into this tutorial not actual spice some addresses uh you you want to know where your fruits come from right actually let's keep this here well you're, we're gonna need this in a second you want to know where your fruit comes from okay uh so what what you will have to what relational databases are all about is relational data okay stuff in one tables relate somehow in a table number two and you can't have one table that holds everything unless you're using datomic which is essentially just database as a value which is just a tree not even the table but only rich hickey knows how that works but that's beside the point okay we want to know where the fruit what the fruit what the fruits address is okay so we might do something like prop int uh, street number or usually these kind of things would be a string a street right a street would contain the street or address one address two whatever and you would have a couple of these you would have the city postcode etc i'm gonna save the story of addresses you probably filled out an address form and you on the internet and you know how it looks uh yada yada you would end up with let's say like a couple of properties right and you're gonna be like the address is a separate object it's not actually the, the address 
has to do nothing with the fruit is not an address why right? like the address one and address two are don't describe a fruit it describes where the fruit come from so surely they should be in a different class right so we create create an address a class address and we're going to stick our address properties into here and i'm just going to make it a little bit easier and just use one property of postcode right because you can have multiple ones and the fruit will have an address so we're gonna have a property uh, that's going to be an address and an address that it comes from the fruit has an address that it comes from uh, address is just another data that we want to store in the database and remember that a lot of fruit can come from the same address okay so you don't want to repeat the data that you store for every fruit that comes from that address you want to store fewer records for the address and point the different fruits to the same address okay now to ha let's remember to have a table of rows of addresses where you have columns postcode we need a db set okay so let's make that let's make address and addresses remember that this is going to be the name of your table as we did here with the id property we're not going to do the same for now again baby steps we're going to use the uh, id property for now and uh, what we're going to do is let's go ahead and just do the silliest simplest thing possible after we add the fruits here we're going to leave that part and we're going to add the address here let's create an address a new address and uh, let's say postcode the moon right and we are going to just add the addresses you probably addresses a lot of s's in the addresses you know just happens um we add the address to the database now you might get a little bit like eh, but the address is on the fruit what well, we just add the address on its own that doesn't seem that doesn't sound nice and if you get that feeling you're you're kind you're, you're kind of getting it uh so let's go ahead and just get this address that we're gonna add to the database right so address SSS, and let's just to list by calling to list on the db set you're gonna grab everything so and this is going to be addresses so let's run this so everything runs and uh, on the fruits uh let's check out the fruits uh the vms don't actually have the address so let's go ahead and remove this select so we can actually uh see the addresses being added on the model themselves okay so let's uh, rerun this and let's take a look at the fruits again and we'll see that the address for both of them is null okay that's fine do we actually have an address that could be on those fruits yeah we do so what uh happens here is that entity framework expects you to have some kind of a relationship between address and fruits the easiest way that you can do this is instead of adding the address here to the addresses db set you can uh, actually just go ahead grab one of your fruits so let's say orange we will grab the address and we'll just set the address here and we can do the same for our apple uh, let's actually do for the apple in a second let's just run this and make sure that when we get the fruit we actually have this address that we just added right so this was for the orange and if we look at the orange we see the address now one thing that's going to happen is that this connection this is going to be reused so what we want to do is put it in a using statement and this is going to have some effects that you want to be aware of so let's grab a using statement and let's go ahead and just put this here so this is now only going to exist until we save it okay so once we're here we want to put the same one here so we're spinning up a new one so this is true database behavior uh, we create an object we save to it we dispose of the object we create the same object we grab stuff from the object the data is still there after disposing of the object okay let's go ahead and run this and uh, yeah okay i managed to put the breakpoint here skills uh, if we look at the fruits now 
and we look at the first one, we will see that the address is as no. What happened, right? Why was it that the, that before when we had this setup uh, without the using statement, we could see the address field, right? So again, if I run this like this, if we took a look at the fruits here, we can see the address field here. Now, uh, what will happen in uh, the field when you go into production and you're working with Entity Framework? What happens here is, again, the transaction, the transaction uh, concept that you're building up a transaction and everything that you're adding here, Entity Framework is tracking. It's keeping it in memory. So until this is disposed, if you do uh, future queries, it's not actually going to query the database because you've just wrote this to the transaction. It doesn't need to get it from the, uh, what's it called, from the database. It can just get it from memory. So what you saw there, the queries that we were doing, we weren't actually querying the database memory. We were just querying the memory that Entity Framework was tracking. Okay. So now that we're actually querying the memory, uh, it's actually trying to simulate SQL behavior. Okay. And this is why we're no longer getting the address because it's no longer in memory here. We have to explicitly say you need to get the address with the fruits. Okay. And this is quite easy to do. All we have to do is we have to just include uh, the addresses. This is essentially an includes uh, uh, an SQL include statement. If you don't know SQL, don't worry. Uh, if you want to include a complex object, so when I say complex objects, these are classes, right? So if you want to include a class, a child class within a property, you use the include statement. And if you have sub sub properties you are then going to use then include and if you have multiple classes you're going to use include after this to reset it back to the top level and you can go like if i can use indentation to represent the kind of level structure this would be one here right so it would look like that it, it's kind of like a tree uh, a tree of queries okay but we're not there we just have the address table with a silly postcode okay so we're going to include the address here so let's go ahead and run this and uh, here let's go ahead and take a look we still or not still rather we are now going to have the address again that we have added before okay nice now what sometimes will happen and many times and uh, this is just important to know and uh, different ways that you can add stuff in uh, entity framework what will happen is you will have access to your orange ID. For now, we'll set it to zero and we'll remove it here, right? So we're going to retain access to orange ID. This is just going to be an integer. And what we'll do is we'll get another AppDB context here. And we're going to try to do one of these guys. We're going to try to add the address again to the context, but this time we're going to have an orange ID. Uh, let's go ahead and just run it and just as before uh, because we're just adding an address on its own it's not actually going to belong to any fruit even though we are saying the the include statement here for the addresses actually it's not going to be there either because we haven't saved it so let's actually go ahead and call save changes here again I remember I remember that each time uh, the object is disposed of transactions and okay uh, so again, let's just run this because I added the save changes statement there to make sure the fruits are not here. Uh, sorry, the address is not inside the fruits. It's not here. It's not here. And if we take a look at the addresses, the address is there, right? So there are going to be times where you are going to just have an ID for the stuff that you want to add your address to. You're not going to have access to the whole entity, right? You don't want to be querying. You just... You don't want to query for an orange to add the address to the orange. And let me actually bring back the line that did that. So it was orange uh, addresses equals address. Okay. Um, and I'll comment this out just for reference, right? So we can take a look at it. We don't always want to bring the whole object out, add the address, and then save changes, right? Because for that, we would actually need to query the database. So we'd have to make a trip to the database back add it and then save it we just want to save it we don't need two trips we need one trip uh, 
you have to understand that querying and writing are trips to the database. You want to reduce those as many as possible. And that's, again, going back to the transaction analogy where you're putting stuff into the basket and going to checkout. Okay. So we have the orange ID. How does Entity Framework actually know that when we have done this statement of adding the address to the orange, how does it actually know that that address indeed belongs to orange? Uh, like here, we have an identifier for the primary key and relational, uh, relational databases. What they have are foreign keys as well. So in the database, you would have a foreign key. And this is the convention of entity framework and convention. The best way to explain a convention, if you don't know what a convention is, is you just do it this way and stuff works. Okay. So the convention is name of the parent object. So th this the type of the key is int. Again, so the key of fruit is int because we defined the ID here. And this key is now going to be inside the address. And this is what we're going to define, right? So fruit, name of the parent. So address belongs to fruit. So fruit goes here and then we add ID. Okay, simple enough. Fruit ID is the foreign key. So the ID of fruit, ID of fruit on the address is the foreign key. So how does this help us? What we can do now is we can grab the orange ID uh, because we're going to set it here. We can grab the, let's let me know, let me grab the fruit ID and assign the orange ID to the fruit ID. Okay, so now if we run our application, we'll assign the foreign key. And if we take a look at the fruits, we will be able to see the address here that belongs to the orange again, right? And we're going to see the fruit ID again. And going over the point where you can uh, configure this, uh, you don't actually need to configure this as a shadow property. Uh, Entity Framework does this on its own. So let's go ahead and delete the fruit ID. And we're going to be like, oh my God, we don't have the fruit ID anymore. What do we do, right? Fret not. We have this object that we can use the same way. So let's go ahead, copy this. We're going to pass the address into here. And uh, this is where we're uh, Entity Framework tracks these kind of objects, whether you do it at the add stage or at entry stage, it tracks it at mere interaction. So we're going to take a look at the address. We're going to grab the property, not int. Remember that the convention was fruit ID, current value. Let's just go ahead and set it to orange ID. Okay, let's go ahead and run this. And I guess my bad that you actually do need to do this definition for uh, the on model creating. So it would keep track of it in the background on its own. But if you want to make entity framework aware of it, I guess you'd have to define it. So let's go ahead and grab the address. Let's define fruit ID. So without this, uh, the database, the relational database, like SQL, MSSQL, whatever, would still be aware of the fruit ID. The entity framework layer isn't aware of it or isn't configured to be aware of it. Uh, let's go ahead and run this again. Or maybe I misspelt it. If this isn't here, then I misspelt it. But it is here. So again, here we see the moon for the orange and for apples, it is not. So that's pretty much like a simple little relation between fruit and address and how Entity Framework creates these conventional keys in the background. And if you want to expose these keys to the AppDB context, you go to the on model creating. And again, Visual Studio and other IDs are probably make it very convenient by generating overrides here okay and the last thing we can do is usually what will happen is you want to flatten out the fruit property with the address on to be on the fruit vm so let's go ahead and say something like prop string postcode here so what we'll do in the select statement is we will put the address onto the fruit vm for where we used to do the select before for the fruits, let's no longer get the addresses. What we're going to do is do a select here. And again, X will stand for the fruit. And we're going to select a new fruit VM. 
and here we're gonna just select the name uh, orange orange no x dot name and we're just gonna assign the postcode as well just so we can see what happens when one is null one isn't and how you can handle it so we will go into addresses we'll select postcode and eh, where should we var a equals five or actually never mind let's put a breakpoint here and it will stop right there nicely but i'm, I'm imagining we're going to get an exception first no we're not going to get an exception let's go ahead and take a look at fruits we're going to take a look at this is orange we have moon and if we take a look at apple we have no yeah so it doesn't throw an exception before you had to do something along the lines of not that this yeah you'd have to check for nulls and then you'd have to supply your own so if it's null etc you had to do all that kind of malarkey but now i guess entity framework actually takes care of that right so you'd flatten out your properties right that uh, like that and there are harder relationships like one to many and many to many relationships and uh, self-referencing relationships i'm not going to cover all of them in this tutorial if you want a full entity framework tutorial you know what to do leave a comment upvote the comment that says we want an entity framework tutorial i'll get around to it at some point but we will be covering one to many in this project but this is essentially just an overview of what entity framework is how to use it with link and what it actually is in terms of your rows columns and how to define tables with their names, how to configure shadow properties, which I think are quite important, what provider to use, and then how to map it to another property, right? So we're actually grabbing stuff from the database and selecting and selecting it into a whole different object. And of course, the whole shindig with the transactions and the lonely read line. Let's not forget about that, the star of the show. But nevertheless, this will be it for this episode. If you enjoyed it, leave a like, subscribe. If you have any other questions, make sure to leave them in the comments section. Don't forget to join the Discord channel. And hopefully, I'll see you in my other episodes.